Uh, welcome to your UN house and to the 23rd session of Bhutan Dialogues. Our theme for today is retirement and new beginnings. <laughs> Many of us plan our retirement, some with joy, some with some fears. According to the World Health Organization, people are living longer and human longevity will continue to increase in the coming decades. This projection yields more urgency for people to design lifestyles around retirement activities they find mentally stimulating. Regarding our speaker, we are fortunate that Om Kamsan Chodhan, a former UN staff member, but also holding degrees in psychology and sociology. She owns and runs a publishing house, Rian Books, the first here in Bhutan. She has written a number of books, including Dawa, The Story of a Stray Dog, The Circle of Karma, Tales in Colour, and other stories. <coughs> Our host, Dr. Karma Funso, has a particular interest in taking the insights of the past into the work we do today. The past is one of the foundations of the now. This practical bent is most clearly actioned in his leadership of Loden Foundation, which focuses on entrepreneurship, amongst other issues, and strengthening and documenting the oral traditions of Bhutan. After tea, I would like you to invite you to come back for an add-on session to Bhutan Dialogues. Today we are fortunate to have Nawang Chodan, who will be speaking on acceptance, empathy, and resilience. Nawang is a graduate from the Metropolitan University of Prague, Czech Republic. She is one of the young entrepreneurs who won the best business idea during the Women's Startup Weekend in September. As our regular initiative to support young entrepreneurs, we are fortunate to have Sering Yangshin Lepchak, who leads Drug Instant Noodles. And of course, we know that so many people here in Bhutan are so keen on instant noodles. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I would invite all of you to put your phone on silent because you, of course, will remember that we are videoing today's experience as usual and we want to make sure that we end up with good uh, YouTube and podcast facilities so that the rest of the people of Bhutan can avail of this great opportunity to hear some great people speak wisely and openly. <laughs> Over to you, colleagues. Thank you. So, uh, welcome to Bhutan Dialogues, Ashi. Yes, uh, this is the last session we are having for 2019, mm -hmm. and it's a great honor for us to have you finally. We really wanted you to come here. Uh, so, thank you very much for taking time out from your busy life in Bhumdang and uh, joining us. I have known you for many, many years. Uh, you have been my school teacher in the 1980s, and we have worked together a lot. Um, and uh, with all honesty, I must say, um, you are an exemplary Bhutanese woman, <laughs> a paragon uh, to me in so beautifully blending modernity with tradition, simplicity with sophistication, humility with hard work, honesty with hospitality, and someone, as I often say, who is full of grace and no air. <laughs> So I know you quite well, but I think for the benefit of our audience, I'll still have to follow the ritual of asking you to tell a little bit about yourself. Um, how did you come to be who you are right now? Can you, I know this is a very difficult question for you to sort of tell your life story mm -hmm. in a few minutes, but if you can touch on some milestones, some factors that mainly shaped your life and made you who you are uh, to basically Tell us a very brief version of your life story. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Doctor, for this wonderful words 
of praise and uh, comfort for me. Um, as you said, um, to very briefly tell you my life story, my life story is very long, so you'll have to tell me when to, when yes. to stop. Um, I look around and I don't see a lot of, uh, I mean, I don't see, I, I'm very happy to see the young people, but I don't see many people of my age because I think peop if I could see somebody of my age, some of my um, group, they would understand what I went through most. Mm. Because um, I was born in a very privileged house in, the, in central Bhutan, in Bumtang. And uh, at the time I was born, uh, you know, the social system was such that we still had this very big distinction between the um, privileged aristocracy or nobility or whatever we like to use. And um, it was a very different um, situation. But in 1952, uh, oh, I was born in 1952, 1962, <laughs> I was one of those um, lucky, now when I look back and think, I was one of those lucky people um, who was recruited to be sent to a school in India. Because at that time, there were not many <coughs> secular Western modern schools and education department. At that time, I think it was not even education department, we just the government, mm. whatever that was at that time. Mm. We were chosen and sent to schools in India. And uh, with very little briefing, we weren't told what it was or how we would be going there or what kind of schools or what kind of education. We were just sent. We were just picked up and sent. And of course, um, now I hear that at the time my parents decided to send me, the village was shocked because they had never... Uh, had the experience of a girl child being sent to a modern school, especially out in India. So I heard later on that um, there was a big... Uh, in, in fact, the elders from the village came to try and stop my parents from sending me. Why should you send a girl to school? She doesn't need to go to school and things like this. But in spite of all this, I went to school. Um, and that was a big, big, big thing. There was no turning back. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the experience in school was something that really numbed you. Because we didn't know. At that time, we knew there was India outside Bhutan, but we didn't know what Indians looked like. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what India was about. And then through this, the surrounding of India and the Indian culture, we were put into <laughs> schools uh, Catholic schools and I went to a uh, Irish Catholic convent. The shock of seeing these women covered all up, blue eyes, you know, searching you. So sorry, the Irish had blue eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, quite a frightening, it was really a, an experience that really, you know, petrified you. We didn't know what was happening. Then, of course, because we had not been taught any language, I didn't know any Hindi, Nepali, Bengali, mm -hmm. English, so we were shocked into, shell-shocked into silence. We were not allowed to speak, we, were not, we couldn't communicate in the language. So the privilege of being chosen was a very traumatic turning point in my life. And uh, at least for six, seven months of the year, I lived in silence. Okay, so this was a really important, a very crucial time in my life, and that will come on later when I talk about folk tales. Mm -hmm. That was one of the big things, and um, the education, and then my, uh, I don't know, resilience, or my not even knowing what it would lead to at the end of the road, but insisting on finishing my school, although many uh, kind and concerned people said, class three, enough, you can read and write, oh, enough. No, I want to go. Beyond and beyond and beyond. And I sort of just shuffled into college because I thought that's the next thing you do. Now from a very strict Irish convent, I went to a very strict Hindu college <laughs> in Delhi. Okay, 
it had the name of mm. being Benjis. We were all sisters. You know, nothing. Uh, we, in fact, everybody was shocked that I came in jeans and I didn't have this, you know, modesty. They called it a modesty to cover myself. So now, throughout my life, I always have a mod <laughs> modesty <laughs> to cover myself. So I went there, and of course. When we came out, they weren't so many. When we came, when we finished education and came back to India, uh, came back to Bhutan, Bhutan government had a very good program, and I think a it was a really a wise thing to do because many of us were coming back to Bhutan, having lived abroad in India for 14, 15 years. So they said we were completely <coughs> uh, alienated from our culture, and they had what we call the national service. So I was one of the few people who went for national service. And uh, the, uh, the idea was to re uh, reorient us, to uh, not to just be put into your office in Thimphu and get on, but to reorient us and send us back to our roots to find out a little bit more. And because I was one, I think the only girl in that badge out of consideration, I was allowed to go and work in Bumtang. The others were sent to other, other districts. And these were all, you know, experiences that I had that had a big impact on me. But personally, the biggest impact was the year I went to school. Um, my father died two months after I had left school. Two years later, my mother died. And I was orphaned. I grew up as an orphan, and I didn't have foster parents. I always knew that Ugin Shuling was my home, but I didn't have a family as such. So I was really like a, um, what do you say, a wild child, a wild flower, or a weed growing among the flowers. <laughs> you know, and that never he that's always there, and that's the biggest turning point. And I think because I was scarred, you know, having lost my parents. That is one of the big, big reasons that I felt my life in Ugin Chuling had never been severed. It, I had never left Ugin Chuling. I stayed there. I was stuck in the memory of my childhood there. And that's what probably is the reason why I went back I mean, People often these days talk about uh, traumatic upbringing <coughs> being negative for uh, the person. But then when we look at the Bhutanese tradition, it's often hardship, and then meeting the unknown other, you know, cha, no cha. you keep the cattle with other, uh, uh, oneself and let the children work under others, that's an old adage. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think this kind of hardship and sort of, uh, difficulties you faced when you were young contribute to making you more successful? I don't know, um, I can't say successful, but my life, I think, um, I don't know if I'm successful, I, can, I never read myself as a success or anything like this, but I think uh, what you said is true, that it has a big impact on if you're raised by a family, a loving family or whatever other family, or raised, by, uh, <coughs> raised in an environment where you are not the child of anybody mm -hmm. around you. And I think that was important for me because I think uh, um, your role models, your ethics, your mm. sense of who you are, all comes from your parents. And the parents are the people that you look up to, you try to emulate mm. them, learn from them. And I never had that. Mm. And that I felt, um, even um, when I was bringing up my own children, you know, when I was in a situation that needed some kind of, um, um, you know, involvement or mm. some kind of way to handle it, I always said, how would my mother have handled mm. this? And that there was no answer, it was mm. just silence. Mm. So you had to, mm. but I think you're right in that you become much more mm, empathetic mm. to mm. others in similar situations. Mm. You become much more uh, self-dependent. You rely on yourself mm. to make solutions, to go on <coughs> forward. Mm. Because I really, uh, in the days, um, when we finished school, we didn't know what we were supposed to do. We just knew that you had to finish school. There was no kind of counseling. We weren't prepared. But the biggest difference was that when we came back, jobs were assured. Mm. 
we could go into you know any any department which was just forming at the time would have taken in a college graduate but because i had been so influenced by the education system of service and uh, um you know uh, that i was always looking at social mm. sector and mm. looking at health and teaching and things like this so we weren't ambitious but we were just being pushed into these directions but because yes. what influenced us in our life yes. uh, you are being very modest in saying that you've never seen yourself as successful I, mean, I can again admit that i have been heavily influenced by you uh, there are many other people who also look up to you and uh, get inspiration from you um you finished your education then you were also i hear the first local officer for the un in bhutan mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um how did you get into the the next phase as i call it of being a writer now you are mm-hmm. today uh, as everyone knows perhaps the first and the foremost uh, folklorist and <coughs> novelist uh, especially in publishing your books internationally mm-hmm. so uh, can you tell us a bit more about the transition from student to your uh, yes. professional work yes um well, why i was saying that i'll be coming back to my school years is as i told you we were locked in silence you know mm. i couldn't speak there were bhutanese girls already in the school i went <coughs> to but you know that uh, i couldn't speak with them because i didn't know dzongkha mm. and i was the only one who spoke bumtangkha So I really mm-hmm. couldn't speak with anybody and uh, I came from a background even though we were privileged and our temple was full of books and you know uh, there were no way that you could read or tell stories except the folk um how do you say the storytelling the tradition of storytelling was very very mm-hmm. strong and that must have impacted on me very very heavily because when i was locked in silence in this convent i l- couldn't talk to anyone and nobody really made an effort to talk also they you know i was just we were like sheep we were just being pushed mm-hmm. into room number so and so and room number so and so and now do this and like this and then um, i looked forward to the nights in the night i would go to bed and cover myself and tell myself my stories i had heard at home mm-hmm. so all the stories that i have written down in my folk, first book of folk tales were stories that i recounted to myself in the night and that was mm-hmm. really an important thing that kept me at least kept me connected i knew another reality mm-hmm. i knew another situation then that gave me the solace mm-hmm. to be that i was not uh, you know completely alone who, who Now, told you those stories at the village my uh, mm-hmm. there were a lot of older people and we that was the only thing that we did we told stories to each other we listened to stories and things like this so it was very very important for my was that it really saved me now what happened many years later is when i married and uh, had my own children we always my husband and i we always try to tell them stories then both my daughters were born in bhutan after they were able to you know they were in their i think 2 and 3 we left bhutan and my husband is from switzerland so we lived in switzerland for a while so there was a huge cultural shift for these girls and they were just beginning to get comfortable in switzerland with another language it was german language then in the next few months we were in the US and they were going to sc- the local school there and uh, children are very perceptive and very impressionable and they said what uh, i told you not to come that you would <laughs> the two daughters are here <laughs> so my daughters i told you not to come <laughs> so they uh, they really, really had an identity crisis they were speaking bumtangkha they were learning german and they were thrust into a nick uh, into another situation altogether within the matter of months and they often said who are we what are we and they said can we tell the stu- uh, you know because i was uh, still a bhutanese mother feeding them rice and things like that and one of them even came and said can i tell in class sometimes we eat pasta and potatoes <laughs> <laughs> they were really going through a crisis so it was for them 
I said, I have to share. It is my duty to give them a bit of my cultural legacy, my heritage. So I started to write down the stories that I had heard in my childhood and I, that kept me you know, breathing and mm. kicking and alive to give it to them. Because I, as I wrote the stories for them, I also thought there must be other children like this who are being, you know, shifted from one situation to the other that you really don't know who they are. So I wrote the first collection, Longhand, mm -hmm. because at that time I was a student, mm -hmm. couldn't uh, really afford a computer or anything like this. And I worked on it and worked on it, and it took quite some time. And then later on, <coughs> then we uh, were transferred back to Asia and uh, we were working in Laos at the time, and uh, at the time that we were in Laos, we uh, had only two hours of electricity. Mm -hmm. So I used to charge my computer during those times. By that time, I had a computer. So I wrote down the stories and I worked on them because I, there was nothing else for me to do in Laos. So I worked on my stories and had quite a substantial compilation. And I came when I came back to Bhutan, I, w I went back to my village and I actually tried to verify and identify the people who told me stories. And I said, is it like this? Is it like this? So I did a lot of, mm -hmm. although it was a spontaneous recollection of the stories I had heard, I did go to them and get their approval and say, is this how you told me? Is this the way it is? So that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. And by the time it reached quite a fine stage, my children were no longer really interested in the story. <laughs> yeah. So, mm. so um, then uh, the next step was to try and s I got a little ambitious and I said maybe I can send this and get it published. But publishing is an experience that I had nobody to talk to, nobody I could not confide in anybody or I could had nobody to tell me. So the next thing I bought a book, I don't remember the author, it's called All About Publishing. So I went chapter by chapter, chapter by chapter, and did all I had to do, and sent my manuscript to different publishing houses. And uh, uh, I was very fortunate that a publisher in Thailand uh, took on my stories and said, let's wear, yeah, White Lotus. He's a, a quite a specialized publisher who doing really on Myanmar and Thailand and mm. uh, Cambodia. So he said, I've never taken, uh, taken anything from Bhutan. I wouldn't know how to do anything about a book if it's published. But if you can deal with your side of sales in Bhutan, I will, I will venture into this. So this is what happened. And this was the, really the uh, biggest milestone in my uh, writing career. Nice. Yeah. So you have seen the literary culture in Bhutan uh, grow. Um, in a way, we have gone from a totally oral or largely oral past almost directly into an audiovisual future. And we have missed the growth of the uh, literary phase properly. Mm -hmm. How do you see now as a senior writer? You have written well over a dozen books already. Mm -hmm. Is the literary culture, reading, writing, culture in Bhutan uh, promising. What are your advices for young, emerging, aspiring writers? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's true. I think what we did, uh, what we have, to, what has happened to us is that we have come from an oral tradition <coughs> to uh, the digital age, and we have missed the literary, um, you know, uh, we do this, I think the reading, people always talk about the reading habits and uh, I was really quite surprised when some people of my age said, uh, we have missed that the reading culture in Bhutan has gone down and I always say there was never a reading culture in Bhutan. <laughs> we, it hasn't gone up or it hasn't gone down but it, it is not significant <laughs> because reading and writing was confined to the monks. Yes, <laughs> it was confined to the monks. Books were kept in the temples. We worshipped the books. We offered made water offerings in front. It was locked up. And when we needed to read, the books were brought to us by a cleric, no? like by a monk or a gumchen or something. So there was really a distance between the general public and books. 
And many of us, our parents, and even I think the next generation of parents in Bhutan had really no connection to books. And then the digital age came and it's so convenient, you know, you can just... Uh, so I think reading is something that not by uh, anyone's choice, but by default of how we developed mm -hmm. is uh, missed out. And I think uh, um, people still... I look at my own village of 20 households with about 120 people. Every household has you know, all the electronics. They have mm -hmm. rice cookers, they have mm -hmm. televisions, each family member wants a mobile phone, and that, of course, has to be the latest that is in. Mm -hmm. But go to any house, not a single book. Mm -hmm. And what was really interesting is just recently, just a few days ago, uh, we repaired a Chorten that, you know, Chorten is one of these monuments that broke down, <coughs> and we repaired it, and when we were putting it back, we were saying, let's, you know, what, it seems it's a tradition when you put it back at the Zoom, or the precious things that you put into the, uh, de um, into the Chorten, mm. is what people, you know, have access or want to do it. And people are bringing all sort of things, you know, little jewelry and little ritual objects and things like this. And people brought books, which were, which they had received when they go to Budgaya. <laughs> <laughs> When they go to this big prayer meeting in Bodh Gaya and they receive free handouts of books, mm -hmm. they're bringing books to put into the... <laughs> so books are still revered. <coughs> books are still looked at uh, something that's sacred and that should not be, you know. And I, I couldn't tell them to take back the books. And these were new mm -hmm. print books which... Uh, yes. that I, I normally tell people not to... Uh, imprison or lock up books in a monument because the books are meant to be read. <laughs> and yeah. Enlightenment can be sought through reading and study and contemplation and not by And I was mm. saying now we should at least wrap it up in yes. the <coughs> news uh, in plastic paper so that the rain doesn't damage <coughs> it and when it falls down again somebody else <laughs> might read this book. Mm. So uh, I think our relationship with books as a source of knowledge other than school is uh, somehow we have to uh, do something about that because books are for studying. Books are where you get your knowledge and you're tested on and you're judged on. Books are not for pleasure as yet in Bhutan for the general public. But uh, on the whole, uh, we have gone from some 20% literacy or so to now well over 70% of the population being able to read and write. You run a publishing house. What kind of manuscripts, what kind of written literature do you receive when you judge the emerging, aspiring uh, literary, sort of, um, the literati in Bhutan? Mm -hmm. um, we started with very uh, ambitious, the idea of uh, having a publishing, a small publishing house. One of our objectives was to encourage people to write and that we would at least do one Bhutanese author, publish one book. Um, and um, in terms of that, we have not been very successful mm -hmm. because I think the general idea of Bhutanese writers have, um, they have not made a differentiation between a printing house and a rigorous, critically uh, worked on work of literature. Mm. So we did in the f uh, few, in the beginning years, we did get people bringing us manuscripts and uh, saying, you know, when is it going to be published? Mm. Or I even had young, and this, this, this innocence and naiveness mm. that they mm. come with. One author even came to me and said, here, make me internationally famous. <laughs> 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 I said that's right, and then you, uh, we even have a format which is on the website saying that you know this is the um, procedure that you have to go through, and uh, please uh, follow this. And then after a while, we stopped getting because people think that we are too choosy, or I don't know. I hope they don't think we are arrogant or we are unfeeling or anything like this. But we have not. Uh, we have still yet to have a sense of what publishing a book means. Mm -hmm. Printing, you can print anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that is the reason why a lot of Bhutanese people 
uh, self-published, yeah. and uh, in a way, it's uh, that's the way to go. But I think there has to be some rigorous critiquing of our work. <coughs> and you have once you've written a book, I think you have to be able to expose yourself and stand the criticism, because some of the criticism are very useful. Mm. For instance, when I wrote my book on the chili and cheese, it took me a long time because uh, the editor, who knew a little bit about Bhutan, was so, so critical that we stopped in midway, mm. uh, that she, she was so uh, critical, and finally the a publisher said, you know, we have to get another editor. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we, I had another editor who I didn't meet, somebody in Canada edited, who doesn't know anything about Bhutan. Mm -hmm. But it was, but it took me a long time. And there was really uh, a lot of um, instances in the process of this when I said, maybe I should give up. <coughs> so I think mm -hmm. some of us uh, have if you really want to write, I think we have to have mm. support groups, very generous and supportive support groups, but mm. also critical mm. support mm. groups. And mm. see, you know, constructive you to, criticism. Yes, constructive mm. criticism. And I think that is uh, very un Bhutanese in a way because we are very generous. We always support, even mm. if it's a really <coughs> bad idea, <laughs> good idea. Come on, and things like that. And we have to, I think that is a, that's a mm. support syndrome, irrespective of what is a small society syndrome. Mm. We all want to help each other, mm. you know. And uh, I think this comes out also in our literature. Of course, there are academics like Dr. Karma and people who have uh, international, internationally famous, <laughs> as Paul said. And you have the substance to stand on, and you have. But I think we have to and work hard. And uh, people always. Uh, one of the questions that I get asked always is, "What inspires you?" I think it's very difficult to say this or that inspires. If you want to write, everything inspires you. A conversation, a person, a look, a insight. It's 1% inspiration and it is 99% of sweat and hard work. It is. It needs a lot of time. It needs, you have to give yourself, I mean, I don't want to lecture you, but this has been my experience and since doctor asked this question, I would like to uh, be honest about it. Yes, I know. Uh, certainly you are doing of Bhutanese literary uh, world, so uh, I think a lot of young people look up to you and uh, such constructive criticism, harsh as it may sound, is going to go a long way. Um, as you saw, a lot of people know you as a writer, um, but then I would like to also touch on your other uh, level of love, and that's Ugin Chuling. You talked very sentimentally earlier about your connection to Ugin Chuling. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was around the time when a lot of these old establishments with great riches and wealth are often neglected. Sometimes even the relics are brought out and sold or transferred. Uh, people move to urban places. But you, some 20 years ago, decided to go back and revive the center. What made you do that? Mm. Uh, Doctor, um, it was not only 20 years ago. I think, as I said, my link um, to my home and to my in, um, to my community, since it was so uh, cruelly, in a way, severe, that I never felt detached. I was always connected to it, and even um, in the old days when we had to walk so many days to go home. I mean, the first first time we went to school. Now we are talking about, uh, you know, you cannot go to school. The schools have to be within, what is the mm. distance now by UN uh, standards? The schools should be how close to your homes? You know, no. One hour or how? Something like that. Yeah, something like that. Uh, <laughs> we've come that far. Uh, and I had to walk. I mean, I'm, I, that's why I said there's no, nobody of my age group. But we walked for 12 days. Mm from Ugin Chueling to Galipo, yes, mm. to go. And um, even that, I think, just strengthened the distance and the hardship of traveling away from home, sort of brought me closer to mm. home. Mm. 
Mm. And uh, I didn't have a home because I told you I was an mm. orphan, mm. so I really didn't have a home. I was uh, uh, hosted by different families because of their charity or their responsibility or whatever. But Ugin Chilling was the only home I knew, so I mm. knew I would go back. And even after I fall, uh, finished college and uh, started working, and uh, met my husband and I was all romantically flying in the air and all. And when we wanted to, uh, when we decided to get married, I said, we cannot leave Ubinjuli. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, didn't know what that meant, but mm -hmm. he said, okay, <laughs> because I think he was also floating somehow. <laughs> so so that, that was something that uh, was a threat in our relationship all the time. And then, when we uh, when the, when the time came uh, and before even 20 years whatever little we had we always supported uh, with small things with the rituals with the infrastructure and so on. so it was the most natural thing that when uh, he retired actually and uh, we went back to Ogunjuli that's what it is so it's actually a very much uh, um, it's much more than just a physical activity. It was a very deep spiritual existential search for yourself in mm -hmm. a way, to go back to your origins, to mm -hmm. find yourself, mm -hmm. which has been lost in this very chaotic, mm -hmm. uh, distracted upbringing. Yes, Would you say that? No? I, I think it's mm -hmm. true. I think it was. Mm -hmm. I never really... Uh, and uh, my husband told me that we could have lived anywhere, but you would never be happy anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, going back to Ubin Chilling is bringing me happiness, but mm -hmm. it's hard work. Mm -hmm. It is hard work, mm -hmm. and it's, um, mm -hmm. it's very different to what I imagined, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because so much change has happened in the mm -hmm. last 40, 50 years mm -hmm. that it's a new beginning. That's mm -hmm. why I say yes. it's a new beginning. Uh, you know, because um, as I said, when I left in 1962, I was the privileged daughter of a feudal lord, you know. And I went there as an I would go back as an ordinary citizen, equal to everybody in the village who were at time working for us. Mm -hmm. And I have to find myself a new niche. Mm -hmm. I have to be find a new beginning mm -hmm. under this democratic, socially <laughs> equal, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. non-hierarchical society. Is it like this in Timpu? At least in Bumtang, we try mm. to be <laughs> non-hierarchical <laughs> and you know equal. Mm. So I have to find my uh, mm. and history, mm. even though it's fifty or forty years, it's very recent. Mm. These ch these changes happen in one lifetime, mm. and it's very difficult to find yourself um, being accepted as a new person at mm. the new beginning, yes. and something that we struggle with yes. all the time. A couple of years ago, when I visited you and uh, Walter and Ugin Chilling, you were quite overwhelmed by the challenges you faced, mm -hmm. uh, especially to build and, or rebuild something that's so rich and um, special as Ugin Chilling, with uh, shortage of material supplies, social support. Mm -hmm. um, have you managed to overcome those challenges? And can you tell the audience briefly about what Ugin Chilling is? What is the what should bring them there if mm -hmm. they haven't mm -hmm. been there yet? Mm -hmm. uh, Ugin Chilling, um, uh, it's a house on a hill. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old house mm -hmm. which has uh, quite a long history and uh, it is considered to be the home of you know, one of the privileged families in Bhutan. And with the social changes, which I'm sure everybody knows about, um, um, houses like this became redundant because they didn't fit in the new social order. Okay, because we, we all became, until the 1950s, there was a hierarchy, a recognized, we were privileged, but by uh, mid-1950s, we were all equal citizens. Nobody had priv privileges or rights, uh, but the house, couldn't, we could adjust. As people could adjust, the house didn't know how to look after itself. It was a house that was built a hundred years ago. The, I mean, the history was much longer, but the present house was built after the earthquake. So it came to, uh, it was about hundred years ago. It just stood there like an idiot, you know? <laughs> the rain was coming in, things were falling, 
and um, you know it had no status. It it was a important um, religious center, but then there are so many new religious centers. So I mean, <laughs> old ones. Who wants to look after dripping uh, roof and collapsing <laughs> walls and things like this? So it was. If we wanted to be mm. successful mm. Uh, and economically <coughs> economically successful, it was a really jumping into a bottomless pit because everything had to be taken care of. And one of the things that we decided was not to ask for any kind of exemptions. Mm. So although it's a very big house, we have never asked for any subsidies. We have never asked for any materials uh, other than what we were allowed. Mm. And we did not have any influence in any organization or bureaucracy to say to please help us. We never went there because even though we went into very bad times, we had that much dignity. So we are treated like every other household in Bumtak. So to process your wood permit, to process your stone permit, we had no connections. We had to go through days of waiting, days of negotiation, days of uh, uh, officer on meeting duty, workshop duty. You know, and waiting. So patience and endurance mm. was something that we learned. Mm. Being working within the realities of what it is for a village house to work. Mm. So, in terms of how much we need it, is beyond any household will need. But in reality, we got drips and drabs, a little bit this year, a little bit that year. So it was a difficult time. Yes. And uh, one of the things that we also decided is not to sell anything. Um, of all of the artifacts that were in the house, of course, we would not touch the religious objects. I mean, beyond what was stolen, we would not touch or make commercial use of any of the religious objectives. And that, in fact, one of the objectives was that we would uh, try to revive what's in the temples. And what's in the, so we didn't sell, we didn't get, uh, if we, you know, I see people, I always give this bad example of people selling to acquire big buildings or trucks or something. We have nothing. We have not exchanged our gods <laughs> for anything material. So it was a big learning example and to learn how it is to really live in the village with no nothing we have. Even now our buildings uh, projects had to stop, stop temporarily because we've run out of wood. And uh, yes. it's... Uh, but on the whole, Ajay, um, I mean the place, you are very modest. It's a it's a site associated with one of the most eminent religious lines in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. It was the home of one of the Tronsa Penlo rulers of mm -hmm. central Bhutan. Mm -hmm. um, it has such great uh, cultural, spiritual wealth and also architectural beauty. A lot of people would have easily turned that into a commercial venture, make a five-star hotel. A lot of things are mm -hmm. happening in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. And that would have been a really attractive spot. And for the audience, mm -hmm. Ugin Chenning is still my best scenic spot in Bhutan. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so you instead went on to turn that into a public benefit organization, mm -hmm. create a foundation, and dedicate all of your ancestral heritage for greater benefit or good of <coughs> Bhutan and humanity as a whole. Uh, do you find that more very fulfilling? Are you? feeling a sense of achievement and triumph that now Ugin is where it is. And for again, as an information for the uh, audience, Ugin Chiling is a museum, perhaps the richest museum in the number of artifacts, especially preserved in its sort of traditional form, and then also has a very comfortable guest house mm -hmm. uh, attached to it, so people can come and visit Ugin Chiling very comfortably. Um, you have done a lot of work that, yes. and it's, it's decades of hard work. Do you feel quite happy now? Mm. Um, well, um, I cannot say that we, uh, that uh, doctor was saying achievement and triumph. Mm. We don't really, I mean, we are still, uh, we always say that we are satisfied with what we are doing, but uh, I don't know if we can really triumph because everything is finite. Mm. You know, the buildings and everything is finite. And we 
started with the museum, which is the central, uh, central building, by displaying things and trying to work on each room uh, to make exhibits based on what we remember. And we started getting the first guests uh, already by uh, 2001. And, uh, you know, we didn't even have the whole museum because we didn't have a master plan or anything like this. We thought just a museum and the rooms used would bring back some life in the world. And over the years we worked and finally in 2014 we registered as a CSO. And uh, as I think ours is one of the few <coughs> Cultural heritage mm. sites besides this one more that uh, music of Bhutan. Music of Bhutan, yes. We are the only two CSOs with uh, cultural heritage uh, status. And but then we realized because we were not asking uh, people for help, we realized that the museum by itself, with its sales of the tickets, is not going to make it. Uh, it mm. couldn't survive. It couldn't pay for itself. So in 2014, when we became a registered CSO, we decided that we had to do something. And that was to give up our residential family residences around the museum and turn them into guest rooms to support, support the temple, because the rituals have to go on. The mu um, museum has to be taken care of every day. There's something new to do. So we created the guest house to support the museum mm -hmm. and the temple. And now we are at a stage when we are not only using the income generated from the guest house mm -hmm. for the museum, that we are also going into the community to try and uh, to try and bring the benefits that we get from this, uh, what we are doing mm -hmm. into the community. And that we have done by uh, trying to give small support to the schools mm -hmm to recognize, we've been doing that since a long time, to recognize the achievers, to give them prizes. And also now, since 2000, this year actually, mm -hmm. we also were able to run a ECCD, and quite successfully, because we didn't qualify for government support, so we started, we uh, had our ECCD. And then we want to do more with education now. So, so there's a lot of social work happening around the museum. Now, uh, going back to our team today, as you both have Diamond and New Beginnings, um, you are the first speaker, Bhutanese guest, who have come out of temple to our session. And what this says is that there are people like you who are showing the example of reversing the rural urban migration. I personally, I must say, I've spent well over two thirds of my life away from home. And every now and then, I dream about going back home to sort of dig my grave where my cradle was, or as the Bhutanese put it, to crack my skull where my umbilical cord was cut. <laughs> um, but then life is not easy in places like Tang and Ura. If you were to advise me on this, what would be the number one challenge that I should be prepared for? We idealize rural life. Mm -hmm. But we know there are challenges. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, let me take the liberty to go back to the title as suggested for this dialogue. And I said retirement and new beginnings. And some people came and said, you didn't have a job. What did you retire from? <laughs> <laughs> now, that, that told me a lot about how the society thinks. A job is a work that you do from nine to five, whether you do a job, I don't know, but you sit in a place for nine to five. <laughs> and it's true, I had, uh, I started as a teacher, then I was with the UN for a while, and then I was basically not doing a nine to five job, but I was doing a lot. Mm. But I think this is again a very uh, 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 reflection of the Bhutanese thinking, that if you don't have a government job, mm. which is nine to five, you know, you're not working. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that is the reason why mm -hmm. so many young mm -hmm. people are out in Thimpu and urban areas looking for jobs where they can sit on a chair mm -hmm. from nine to five, take a long lunch break. <laughs> 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 okay, so this was something that, you know, 
I was retiring mm. from the life that I was living, mm. as I'm sure some of the people will understand here, as a trading spouse. I went where my husband went, but I wasn't jobless. I was doing a lot of things. There was a lot of obligations. Mm. And, um, you know, wherever he was transferred to, I went. And I then we came back to Bhutan, and I lived uh, in Thimphu, at a stretch for 10 years and before that we were here for five years and so I was really retiring from, as doctor said, from the rural, uh, from the urban, urban yeah. settings of comfort and amenities and you know, mm. things like this to going back because that was a fulfillment of my dream. Mm. This was the fulfillment of my mm. lifelong yearning to go back and uh, it isn't easy because mm. this uh, the societies that we left as mm. young people are not the same mm. you know the people but their mindset has changed mm. their attitudes have changed now uh, you know I went from a uh, position of you know from as a, uh, based on my household a position of power to <coughs> being a citizen mm. um, normal uh, equal citizen mm. and to Although people will always, they will always live in karma, you know, or they say ashi, ashi, but what goes on has mm. happened mm. and you are in a completely new environment. You have to find yourself. Mm. And I have a lot of uh, people who come there and who see what's happening and they say, you're not taking your rightful uh, position as mm. a leader. You should be a leader here. I said, history is too fresh. I was coming from a leading <coughs> thing where we were imposing and commanding. Now I'm here to listen mm. and be with the community. Mm. And I'm not going to be the one who is uh, standing in front of my gate and say, this family come and do this and that family come. Mm. All this has changed. Yes. And But my nostalgia is also the personal relationships I have with the families. Mm. and. Uh, and I'm making a conscious effort to relink with them, to bring them into our lives as much as we go into their lives and on an equal footing, you know, if I want to sit with them, they'll push a piece of blank under me or, you know, the, of course I don't get the throne with the brocade cover and all, yes. but, um, but, you know, slowly you have to find your acceptance. You have yes. to be aware what is happening, who is ill, who is uh, having a baby, who is, uh, you know, celebrating. You want to become part of things. You cannot uh, uh, expect uh, them to come to you. You have to go to them. So it's it's very different. But I find that, yeah, the social. And then, of course, uh, Ugin Chuling, since you say it's a holy uh, sacred site, what has happened now in, since I've been there is that we encourage or we welcome the elders who stop on the holy days based on the Putin's lunar calendar, 8th and 15th and 30th, everybody comes around to the circumambulation or just sit and talk and then we try to uh, welcome them offering tea or meals and you know sort of uh, rebonding, new beginnings, yes. new old yes. beginnings. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so there must be a lot of old people going around the temple today, as yes. we speak. No, no, today is a yes. festival okay. down in the valley, so okay. they would so have all <laughs> But uh, what a rich, what an exciting life with so many new beginnings. Mm -hmm. Now, if we imagine a Groundhog Day scenario, mm -hmm. and if you can begin fresh again, mm -hmm. is there anything you would do that you have not managed to do in your life? Mm -hmm. Uh, this is, even though I have achieved in going back to, in Bumtangha we say where uh, tupsaro, where the umbilical cord was cut, your head must crack. That means you were born there and your head must crack there, which means when you're cremated, your head has to crack. That has been achieved. I hope my head will crack there. <laughs> and, but one of my biggest regrets yeah. is I have been somehow a victim of the developmental activities in Bhutan, in that I, you know, the, there are pros and cons. The pros were that I was sent, chosen and sent to one of the most uh, privileged elite schools in school, um, India. But what I miss today, I think I've told you this before, is uh, not having the ability. I write in English. It get, a lot of people get surprised. 
because I don't have the ability in Zonka or Chuke. And that's the education I missed out. And I really envy people like and respect people like Dr. Karma you know, who have the way of expressing and telling, writing in both English, Zonka and uh, Chike. And I am, you know, I, I, I said I was dumbed and numbed and I'm dumbed and numbed. I am sitting on top of books and books and books. We have a very uh, big library, which was actually included in your digital project also. But I can't read them. I can read the titles, but beyond that, I can't read them. We have not only secular, uh, we don't have only religious material, but we have also boxes of secular historical material. And I cannot use them. And it, I, if I would idealize my retirement, I would be doing the work that needs to be done to keep up the infrastructure, but also to be able to read and find out what's in all this. And that is a regret. It's too late. I can, uh, I can read the titles and I can memorize, but I cannot comprehend or elaborate on the writing. This is my biggest regret. And I think today the Bhutanese schools are really lucky in that you have Tsongkha and English <coughs> as uh, uh, you, know, you, you can excel in both. You have access to both. My final question, I should be very open it to, to the audience. What do you do to keep yourself physically and mentally fit and yes. effective? Yes. Uh, physically, of course, I, uh, you know, it's a big complex. So I don't uh, consciously do a lot of physical work, but I have to do. It's, I'm compelled by the distances in the place. I live a little bit outside and I'm walking at least 100 times back and forth <laughs> to the museum and the temple yes. every day. And uh, I also lead tours, which is uh, four Five levels. Story. Yes, mm. I have to climb up. But I take rest now. I rest for a while and then tell everybody, please sit down for a while. Later. <laughs> so this is what I do, which is, I think, in... Uh, in uh, in a different way, it is really good for me. Consciously, I walk, I do circumambulations. That is mandatory. I do it every day, at least even for 30 minutes or um, an hour, ideally. But I do that. That's my quiet time, which I like very much. And mentally, mm, <laughs> um, you know, I meet all sorts of people from everywhere. Since the road to the museum has become uh, much more accessible, we meet all kind of people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people ask questions which sort of really <coughs> keep me thinking, you mm -hmm. know. And I think um, it's, it is a blessing that I am not just gone <coughs> and just chanting on my name, I do that a little bit also. But people asking questions, and we have quite interesting, uh, intriguing, conversations and uh, some of them who know that I have written some bring me books so mm. now I have to come to Thimpu to shop. Mm. I get good books and they're mm. very careful in choosing what kind of books. So this is a big blessing for me. Yes. Thank you. Lash. So questions. <coughs> we have I think some five to ten minutes. Um, Aji, um, <coughs> when we were preparing for today's discussion I was I was heartened by the way you explained to me something that I hadn't understood. The difference between his story and her story. Could you explain what that was all about and why it's particularly relevant to those who are interested in gender issues here in Bhutan? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that was an answer to your question, who inspired me, who was my inspiration? And I said that, uh, um, to elaborate a little bit, I think your role models and inspiration comes actually at the age when you're still very vulnerable and you're a child. And because I did not have my parents to be my role models and to learn from them, the most natural thing was that I was uh, very... Um, my role models were the Irish... I'm not saying this only because I know who you are, <laughs> but it's really true that I was, I was really, uh, you know, I really saw them as role models.
because they had lived exemplary lives, they had given up things, and they were here really for the service of the people. And the uh, many people ask, since you went to a Christian Catholic convent, how much Christianity did they push on us? That they didn't do. Mm-hmm. And we did have a very serious subject, which was called moral science. And that was really not pushing anything on us, but just uh, mm. um, telling us universal stories and how it shaped our thinking and our perspectives. And uh, later on, when, we, uh, when I started to look on into our history and see who were the women in our history, you know, we had heard about uh, women in the oral stories we had heard about great women, the woman who was like this and great woman was like this but many of the folk tales we hear of women who were mm, if they were different they were witches they were mm-hmm. demons but where were the good women <laughs> who could we insp- uh, aspire to be like and you look at history and there is not a single woman in the Bhutanese history who has been uh, who has been written about or who has been celebrated. And I think even in Dr. Karma's uh, history of Bhutan, there is just mention of Sokiduji, Shabdung's granddaughter, granddaughter, who, uh, I don't know if you wrote it, but I think in Michael Eris' book, she ruled in the guise of a man, Mm -hmm. taking a man's name. Mm -hmm. What does that say about a society Mm -hmm. which is supposed to be a very Mm -hmm. feminist, uh, Mm -hmm. with very strong women Mm -hmm. characters? We don't have that. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe that's something that young people could do and look and see and, you know, at least, um, uh, you know, rethink history in a different way. And I was uh, saying even in... uh, um, uh, some of the characters that we um, looked to in history, not specifically Bhutanese, but Tibetan Bhutanese women, they are, we mention their names. We talk about Ashnamsa, Namsa Obum, and uh, Ishit Sogel, and things like this. And women related to them, but we related so much to their sufferings, because many of these women began uh, <coughs> had to work very hard against the patriarchy and the male society till they could achieve. So the women I know, women of my age, know how they suffered and how they bemoaned their status and things like this. But none of us went a step beyond to see how they achieved what they did. And I think uh, this is something that we have to look to because they, were, they, they achieved a lot. Uh, even in Dupakunle uh, Snamthar, there is always uh, one passage that I see when he is um, talking to a group of people, and then one of the women, he, I think he talked in song form, isn't it? Lyrical song form. And she sings back to him and says, and she really talks about the situation of women in what century was that? I don't know, like 15, 16, 15th century. 15th century. It's very bleak. Mm. She refers to herself as a doormat and everybody's stepping over her and things like this. And these are uh, things that don't paint a very good picture of what women were in the past. But I think now we have come a long way and there are people who are looking back and analyzing and uh, we are not just... Uh, taking terms and terminologies that have been, uh, uh, that we have imported, but women are really gaining power, and I think there's a lot of work and empowerment that's happening. Is that okay? (laughs) Before the next question, I actually want to add something to that. I think, uh, uh, on the whole, if you look at recorded history, it is his story. So, um, they don't necessarily reflect the actual situation on the ground, perhaps, because they're mostly written by men, and particularly monastic mm-hmm. men. Mm-hmm. So perhaps there was a lot, still a little yeah. more mm-hmm. sort of uh, matrilineal female power in the ordinary societies, no, not the monastic educated literati, but among ordinary people. Um, so history certainly is not the best judge for the actual situation. Um, 
first of all, I'm really honored and delighted to be here. My name is Gordon Gottlieb, and I found my work to come here. So I'm really happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is not really a question, but a sort of like a request and advice regarding, I mean, um, you mentioned that you had a difficult time when you went abroad to study. Um, how did you find, I mean, was it easy to come back and um, immerse with the society you love? Like, did you have to adjust and readjust? Um, it's also my personal struggle um, that I'm still going through, and I would like to hear from you. Like, and uh, of course, uh, as an Roma as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think um, this is a question this is a situation many young people today find yourselves in to come back and to readjust to what it uh, what the realities are um, that's why i said we had this um, you know there was a mandatory social national, national service, service that we had to do was what was a six months mm -hmm. course in uh, readjusting to ourselves and in those days it was easier because they were um, you know, there was fewer things happening. We were not distracted uh, with all many, all the different kind of things that are here today. And we were very eager to go back home and do whatever, you know, those. But now everyone wants to delay and stay in Thimpu. And mm -hmm. if Thimpu gets boring, go to Pinsuling <laughs> and, you know, move around, but not really go back. And I think that's, that's going to be the struggle for everybody because the, um, one of the things is many of the people, uh, many of the young people's parents today have encouraged their children already from day one. You have to succeed, you have to pass your examinations, you have to become a Dasho or, or officer in the government. And if you didn't do that and went back, back to your village, and you were seen as a failure. But I think slowly that's going to shift now. And uh, I think there will be parents who will encourage you to do things that mean something to you and not push you to become a Dasho. And this is something that already in the 1980s in our Jakar school days, it was quite a fun game that I played with little children who came to first, uh, first day school. I taught school also. And I say, why have you come to school? Why have you come to school? What do you want out of school? And little children would say, I want to become a dasho. <laughs> and that, I think, has stayed. Mm. Everybody wants to become a dasho, wants to enter the civil service, <coughs> want to make the cuffs whiter and bigger. <laughs> and, uh, and that has to, I think that mm. has to, there has to be a re, uh, rethinking on that. And we mm. have to, I, yesterday again we talked about it's not the failure of the young people, it's our, we have missed, we have encouraged, we have misdirected our children. I think they, uh, there has to be a time when we tell our children, do what you're capable of. You don't have to be the supporter for all of us. You do what makes you happy, do what you're capable of, instead of pushing the children to become important civil servants. And the good news is the National Service Program is going to come back. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much, Kinsa. It was wonderful. And uh, I just have uh, just a comment on what Dr. Tama and you have been saying about gender. As a half historian, half baked historian, I am very interested in genealogies and the genealogies of Bhutan. And I'm reading, of course, the Ashura Masana is my mm. Bible these days. Mm. And the thing that is really gender biased is very often you have the lineage, never a woman appears. Mm. It's always like if the men, even mm. with green pochi also, they come out mm. like miraculously and no women have been burying them. Mm. It, is a, it is a kind of <coughs> trope in the Bhutanese history and Tibetan history, mm. that women are totally, so I'm just now looking for the mother of somebody very important. I cannot find him, but he didn't come by himself. Mm. So that's number one. <laughs> number one. And number two is, when you read the history of, very rare history you have about women in the history of Bhutan, very often they are linked to a religious, Mm -hmm. So they live through a, a male, f 
figure, a religious male figure. And their stories are very often extremely sad. And I can never, can never get over the fact that Pajodu Gamshipo threw the children <laughs> in the river <laughs> without <laughs> telling his wife and his seven children were in the river. <coughs> that is, must be for a mother. <coughs> That must be heartbreaking. Mm. It might be a metaphor, mm. but it's written. And you can see the suffering when she sings about it. It's mm. heartrending. Mm. So it's true that very often, mm. because the story is his story, women are really the suffering lot, mm. or disappearing lot. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, it, it's so right at the back. That will be the final question, I think, if <coughs> no one else. Um, I want to uh, follow up with Dr. Gomson for a comment on gender and how Bajan seems to have a very, um, really complicated relationship with it because in one case compared to most South Asian countries, our women are considered much more liberated. We have tend to inherit to the matriarchal line and, um, and there are cases where I think in Paro and Ta, when the men go to trade or across the Tibetan and uh, in the Tibetan Chinese border, the house goes into the hands of the woman. So, but then at the same time, we've also heard of cases where um, when you go to a bank, even though the woman holds the property in her name, she's not allowed to do anything, mortgage it, or um, make it um, liquid without the approval of a male house member. So, some people also talk about. Um, gender in the sense that it's been imported as a Western concept. So what do you have to say about this very like complicated notion of matriarchy in Bhutan <coughs> and um, the state of gender studies on the regarding Bhutanese women? <laughs> I think uh, what uh, Francois was saying about uh, women and uh, how they've been missed out um, I think there's very little written act actually about the general public and it's only the better of households. And I think the concept of the bone lineage, the, which only the males could have, uh, it's like the blue blood concept, only the males could have that. And women, that is the bone. The bone lineage is only with the men only the men carry the dungju, and they are capable of spreading it. Women only carry the blood lineage, which is easily corruptible. <laughs> you, know, you marry wrong, and you have corrupted. I'm, I came from a household where they valued dungju, and with me marrying a Swiss farmer, I've completely corrupted <laughs> the, blood, uh, the bone line. You know. So this is, uh, and as you said, I'm sure these great men had fathers. Mm. I had a very interesting uh, statement from a Swiss journalist. I think he came and I showed him our lineage, how for 20 generations there's only a male mentioned, no women are mentioned. And he looked a little bit like this. And he said, mother's baby Father, maybe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there was no way to <laughs> no way to test this. It was just by that you believe that this is the person of, and uh, mm, uh, you know how uh, this had to be preserved. The marriages among the elite had to be you know choreographed, and all these things mm. was because of that. And uh, uh, of course, I make the joke with people who come to the museum and who look at our lineage, that as long as there was a title, they were privileged to say male, 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 male. When it comes to do the dirty house, uh, dirty work of upkeeping the house which the men have destroyed, it comes to me. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and the girl, the lady down here in the corner, no, you talk, talk. It's mm. so, mm. talked about um, the, uh, matriarchal uh, matriarchal and system. And I think there's a lot of studies, a lot of studies that have been done now, isn't it? Scholarly studies, academic studies have been done on that. And I think uh, uh, things are changing. So I don't think there's a 
uh, you know, I get tourist guides who come and tell uh, their groups that this Bhutan is better than any of the South Asian countries. We are a matrilineal, matrilateral society, and I really have to keep quiet because I don't know where to approach it from. I think it's basically very, uh, very different. I think there was a study, I don't know if you read the study by our election, election commissioner now, no? no. Dekhi Pem mm. no. yes. and Adam, Adam Payne, Payne. Oh. who did some uh, study on land ownership and changing mm. things. I think land was in the hands of women it, mm. when it didn't have a value. Mm. It didn't have a monetary, mm. it didn't have mm. a value. Mm. And also it was, every society and every household it was different mm. because land was inherited or the parents had the authority to pass it on to the person who they felt comfortable would look after them in their old age. So the women had to take the ownership of the land, had to look after the parents in old age, and her mobility and her education were. Now, look at the um, land holding documents in Thimphu. They all belong to men because land is so valued. I'm sure there are a few smart women who still hold on the land, but everybody else has, uh, now it belongs to the men. Yeah, that's why you need your father's signature and your father's father's signature and uh, uh, authenticity and census to get it. But uh, I would like to add here that uh, sometimes we get this uh, very um, paradoxical, contradictory situations, also because we look at the whole country and the whole um, culture as singular yes, and monistic. Yes, as a homogeneous, it uh, is not. Whereas, actually, when you look at Bhutan, um, as we speak, there are two Bhutans, I say. There is the traditional Bhutan, who is still <coughs> communicate primarily in local languages, who live in a local cosmological uh, worldview. And then the other Bhutan, which is here in Bhutan mm. Dialogues, where we are talking in very global terms. And the same also, I think, with traditional past, we have the high culture of religion, which is very patriarchal, and then the folk culture, which is <coughs> largely matriarchal. So uh, the historical records are all based on the religious high culture. Mm -hmm. And I think if we see Bhutan as having a diversity of cultures, we may be able to understand things more yes, cohesively. Yes, but my last question to Ajina. Yes. Uh, as a token of appreciation, we offer you two books. Uh, which two titles did you choose? And uh, why? Or, or you can share also your best title. Um, actually, um, I, I often misread. <laughs> so I thought I would talk about two books that I read recently and would like to share something from it. But it was that they said they would give, uh, UN would give me two books of my choice. So I completely misread and I said these were the two books that I read, read. And, um, but I already have them, so. <laughs> <laughs> but you can so, talk about them. Okay, but so this, is, uh, this one mm. is World Enough and Time, and this is like a Bible for me. I read it every day, little bit, little bit, by a woman called Christian McEwen. I think she's Scottish, and, but she lives in the US. And then she writes about how we have lost the art of seeing, mm. listening, and learning, and only we are listening to the siren of technology. Mm -hmm. And on that, she writes about how we can slow down, how we can appreciate everything around us. And uh, I don't know if this is. And this is another book that I read, which made quite an impression on me. And uh, this is really about a present day Mormon family in Idaho in the United States and how this family actually lived in a very warped world of, uh, you know, they thought they would, would be the survivors in the world that was going to end. And it was really the ideology of the father who thought the government was the uh, enemy and the world was going to end. Education was not allowed and uh, Medicine was not allowed, mm. and uh, the children were not even registered. They had no birth certificates. They had no immunizations, 
And this is shocking because this was in the United States. But what is even <coughs> more, um, what, is, what really impressed me was this girl, the writer, broke through all this and got herself educated. She, she was brilliant, but she broke through at the cost of re getting completely estranged with her family, but she came and she's now taken on a PhD. And this is not just one family, but I feel that in this world, you can have spots of ideologies and people follow. You know, it may be completely, um, completely crazy ideas, but people follow. And I think this is how cults, <coughs> wouldn't you, I, uh, so you, you didn't read, but I think this is what yes. cult is. I mean, this is happening. And I think our, um, how is it, our tool <coughs> or our strategy to get out of this warped thinking is to get yourself, to have education. And we are lucky that we have education. And education is so empowering. And there is also the incidence of, you know, they, in this society, in this community, they wouldn't even call the <coughs> doctor to, uh, when they were having babies. And the mother of this child, mother of the author, when she learns to become a midwife, quite reluctantly, she suddenly f becomes so empowered because of her skill. So skills, developing skills, and educating, and opening your mind to the world, it changes a personality. Of course, she also had having to give up everything that she believed in and go into the mainstream education. She also had a nervous breakdown, but she's cured now. But but we are human. Thank you. We have our That's a wonderful uh, closing uh, statement from him because this forum, the Bhutan Dialogues is aimed at expanding our mm. uh, horizons, of pushing our boundaries Point, of thought, exactly. of uh, exactly. cultivating critical thinking. Uh, is a forum where we would like to promote these through civil conversations. So, Ajit, thank you very much for yes, coming you. as our guest, all the way from Bumtang. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> And now, as a ritual, I again conclude the session by citing a Bhutanese piece of wisdom. Yes. So bear with me. I got today a proverb in Zonka, quite relevant to retirement and uh, new beginnings. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really a beautiful piece about how we should gracefully age and retire. I repeat that. Misi gekharki nim Life feels peaceful in old age. The sun feels warm at sunset. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much.